Okay, welcome everyone for to, to the statistical seminar. And today it's my great pleasure to have Irina from Texas AM and from the statistics department. Irina has been working on all kinds of very exciting topic and primarily on the modern high dimensional bio, biomedical data. And she has won numerous awards from NSF and other places, including the David Bayer Young Investigator Award and the Career Award from NSF. And today she's going to talk about a very exciting topic that's trying to combine with Gaussian coppola and data space model and to some very exciting topics. So let's welcome Elena, uh, Irina, sorry. <laughs> and by the way, Thank I just want, yeah, just one, one quick question, uh, one, one note that uh, if you have a question, you can either use the raise your hand function that Christine and I will allow you to speak to the right ask question, or you can just type your question in the chat box or Q and A. And, and, and I, I, will, I, will, I, will, I will notify Irina about like, if there's any questions. Okay. Thanks, let's okay. welcome Irina. Well, thank you. Thank you for such a nice introduction. It's um, really great to be here. Um, I was supposed to come about a year ago and visit in person, but that obviously couldn't happen. So hopefully there will be another opportunity to visit in the future. So I'm going to share my slides. Um, and again, if you have any questions, please feel free to jump in in the middle of the talk. So today I would like to talk about um, truncated latent Gaussian copula model um, that we're going to use for zero inflated data. And as research often takes the village, um, this work actually has been done in combination with a lot of people. And there's a multiple follow-up work that we still continue to be doing. Uh, most of what I'm going to talk about today has been done with my former postdoc, Grace Hune, who is now at FDA. Um, she was supported by the T32 training grant in bioinformatics and cancer, for which on PI is Raymond Carroll. Um, the applications to microbiome data um, primarily has been done with Christian Miller, who is at uh, Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich. And um, in the end, depending on the time, I would like to reflect a little bit on our most recent work where we um, provide more Bayesian interpretation for that model. And that has been done with my current postdoc, He Chul Chung, um, and Yang Ni, who is an assistant professor in our department. So first of all, um, the reason I got interested in this problem is the mixed types of data. Um, and the prototypical example I like to use is the data from the Cancer Genome Atlas project. So here, um, the idea is that the same patients or subjects have a lot of different data that is collected on them. So for example, they can have mutation information, which is binary, presence or absence of a particular mutation. They can have copy number information, which is count. Um, they can have gene expression data, which depending on how you treat it, could be continuous or also count and so forth. And so there's different types of data, often called different view, views or different modalities. Um, and the idea is that they come on the same people, same samples, but they come from different platforms. And so in mathematical notation, you can think of it as a collection of data matrices where um, the rows are matched by the sample and the features are specific to each particular view. And the motivating example um, I'm going to illustrate today is where we have two views, um, gene expression and microRNA measurements from the subjects with breast cancer. And we're interested in finding what is the association between those two views. Um, and we are also interested in seeing whether the found associations are related to breast cancer subjects, which we are going to treat as external information. So in this context, you have two types of data. Uh, you have high dimensionality, even though we reduce the number of features quite a bit. Um, you can see that the number of samples is not as high as the number of variables. Gene expression data on its own is going to be very heavily right skewed. Um, here we're going to treat it as continuous. Um, and microRNA data, and this is really what motivated this project, has lots of zeros. So what I mean is that for some of those variables, up to 50% of observed data are exact zeros. So this is what we mean by zero inflation. Um, that is data, observed data, with significant amount of zero-valued measurements. Often this is sound data, but not always. So why should we care about the zero inflation? Well, there are several reasons. Um, first of all, because you have a significant amount of zero valued measurements, um, that means that the chance of observing zero value is not zero. And so if you use a continuous distribution, they ignore that. 
then your inference will be invalid. Um, secondly, we have an excess of zeros uh, compared to parametric distributions. So for example, Poisson distribution allows for zero, but it has um, not enough mass to account for what we see in real data. Um, and finally, and probably the most difficult part is that the zeros are not often, sorry, zeros are often not actual zeros. They're due to measurement error. In particular, this comes in the sequencing technologies and Onyx data, where zeros are often due to the limitation of the instrument. So what are some other examples um, in, in addition to what I already showed you? Um, so physical activity counts data, that is data collected from wearable devices, such as activity trackers, often has lots of zeros corresponding to the times where the person is not active. Um, ecological abundance data, so for example, if you um, an observer in a particular area for a certain period of time, and you count number of species you observe during that time. Um, sequencing data, as I mentioned, um, and also in the biomedical and psychological research, you can think of um, frequency of a particular event um, as a zero inflated data as well. Another example is the microbiome abundance data. So I know that a lot of um, researchers here may be familiar with this data, but in case you are not. So um, here the microbiome samples go through the certain sequencing protocol. Um, the details are not as important. What is important is that the result of that process is a table, counts table that typically looks like this. So here each of the rows is a particular sample. The columns have what's called OTUs or operational taxonomic units, and they could be combined to analyze the data at different levels, such as species or genus levels. And this table has lots and lots of zeros in it. That's one of the characteristics of the microbiome data. So of course, uh, zero inflated um, data has been considered before, and we have a lot of models for this data. Um, in particular, there are a lot of parametric models that account for zero inflation, starting with um, zero inflated Poisson model, uh, and zero inflated negative binomial model, which while is old, I would argue is probably still the most commonly used model for such data. Um, and I believe that there are some challenges with this model. In particular, um, parametric models cannot always capture the excess of zeros that we actually see, or they can capture the zeros, but then they cannot capture the remaining skewness. Um, and in microbial abundance data in particular, what I will show you is you don't just have a lot of zeros, you also have very skewed measurements. Furthermore, motivated by our original goal, that is to look at the associations between gene expression and microRNA data, what essentially we want to do is we want to model association between mixed data types, where the data types could be zero inflated or continuous or binary. And if you have a very specialized parametric model for zero inflated data, it's not immediately clear how to model associations from that model with another data distribution. For example, how would you model association between Gaussian distribution and zero inflated negative binomial distribution? There is not, I would argue, an obvious answer to that. So what we wanted to do is on the one hand, we wanted to have the more flexible modeling framework. So in particular, we wanted to take into account both a lot of zeros that we see in the data and the skewness that is also present at the same time. Um, but on the other hand, we wanted the modeling framework that is rather flexible so that the joint modeling of this various data types can be achieved. Um, and more specifically, what we're going to focus on how do you estimate the correlation structure in a multivariate data where some of the variables are zero inflated and the other variables could also be zero inflated or could be binary or could be continuous. Um, any questions so far? So what we propose is the truncated Gaussian popular model. And this is the picture illustration of what the model actually does. So for each variable j, we assume that there is a latent Gaussian zj. So here you can think of this five red dots as a sample of size five from 
from uh, Gaussian, standard Gaussian distribution. From that latent Gaussian layer, we assume that there exists uh, a monotone transformation Fj, this is the copula part, that is applied to this measurement. So in other words, this five red dots become five blue dots for some monotone transformation Fj. And what uh, monotonicity does is essentially guarantees that the relative order so if this one is the largest out of five at the top layer, it remains the largest out of five at the middle layer. And then what we add to that is the truncation step. So in other words, we assume that at the middle level, there is some threshold CJ such that everything that is below that threshold is observed as zero, and everything that is above that threshold is observed as zero. So in other words, our observed zero inflated data, which is combination of zeros, and in this case, uh, positive measurements, uh, which fits all of the applications that we have considered, we assume that this observed data has resulted from this two-step process. So Gaussian step, copula step, and then truncation step. Um, mathematically, uh, we start with a Gaussian copula, which is also known in the literature as non-paranormal model, on a vector of p measurements. So you assume that each of this measurement has um, its own, it doesn't have to be the same transformation f, such that when applied to the vector, you get a standard multivariate Gaussian with mean zero and correlation matrix sigma. And then what our model does is it assumes that once you have this Gaussian copula, you have threshold CJ. Again, it doesn't have to be the same threshold. Different variables can have their own threshold, such that it is observed if it's above the threshold and it is zero if it's below. All right, so how does this help us? So latent Gaussian, copula part, truncation part. Well, this is an illustration of the fit to the American Gut Project data. So this is uh, microbiome data. Um, and here we took one particular feature from this microbiome data, where on the horizontal axis is the exact counts for that feature. And on the vertical axis are synthetic counts that are generated either from zero inflated negative binomial model or from our model. And so what you can hopefully see is that for zero inflated model at the low counts, um, zero inflated negative binomial, it captures the data pretty well. It captures the zero inflation. There's maybe a little bit of a kink here, but overall it stays on the uh, y equal x line. However, once you go to the large counts, you can see that synthetic counts are very much under this line, which tells you that it does not capture the skewness it really cannot capture the skewness of the counts, even though it can account for zeros. Um, in contrast, our model roughly stays on the y equal x line, which means it can capture both um, the zeros and the skewness of the data. So the second advantage, modeling of mixed data types comes because we have this latent Gaussian layer. So in other words, all of the features that you observe whether they are continuous or binary or zero inflated, can be viewed as coming from the latent Gaussian features with a common correlation matrix sigma. You then view the copula layer F, which gives you the Gaussian copula, so this is standard. And then from this Gaussian copula, you can then do extra transformations to account for variable data types. So if you just take Gaussian copula as this, then that could be used to model continuous data. If you introduce a threshold in dichotomize that is above the threshold one, below the threshold zero, then you can model binary data. And that what has been done in Fun et al. JSSB paper. And what we're adding to the mix is the truncated part, which is kind of a mixture of the two. If you're above the threshold, you still observe the continuous part. If you're below the threshold, you observe the zero. So because all of this is connected on this latent Gaussian level, essentially the task of finding associations between this mixed features and modeling this associations is equivalent to estimating this correlation matrix sigma at the latent level. So that is our goal. 
And the approach that we're going to take um, is to connect what we can calculate on the observed data to this correlation matrix sigma on the later level. Specifically, for the observed data, we are going to use Kendall's scale, something that we can compute based on the ranks that we observe. Um, and we are going to use the bridge function that connects latent correlations to the candle cell. So the idea is that from latent correlation to candle cell, you can go through the bridge function f. And from candle cell to latent correlation, you can go through the inverse of the bridge function. And I would explain um, on the next slide exactly what I mean mathematically. So specifically, Suppose we have variables J and K. So those are two variables that we want to find what is the latent correlation. So the sample candle cell is something can be computed directly on the observed data based on uh, the rank. The bridge function as defined by FAN is a function so that if we take the expected value of the sample candle cell, we will get some quantity that depends on the true latent correlation and we call this dependence, we explain this dependence relationship for this bridge function f. And then the idea is rather simple. If you know what f is, if you know the explicit norm of f, then based from that moment equation, this gives you a very natural moment-based estimator, which is the inverse of that f applied to um, sample candle cell that you can compute from the data. So our contributions here is that um, this F is not as easy to find. And we find what it looks like exactly, exact analytical form of F um, for every pair of the three variable types. So continuous binary has been done um, by Fan et al. before. We added continuous truncated, binary truncated, and truncated truncated. Um, the deviations. Uh, ended up being much more tedious, but the form is explicit, and I will show you some examples. I can show you all of them in the end if you want to see them all. Um, also, uh, one question that you may have had is, okay, I found this function f, and I claim that we can take its inverse. So strictly speaking, uh, to take the inverse, I need to prove that it exists, which the um, proof relies on showing that this function f is monotone. Um, so we can show that, in fact, it is monotone, so the inverse can be taken. Uh, we also show that this estimation approach is consistent. But again, the results um, for truncated case um, actually require us to use a different proof technique um, than the results that have been used for continuous binary case. So here's what these bridge functions look like. So here, um, one example where you have two variables one of which is truncated type, which is we use to model zero inflation, and the other for simplicity is just continuous. And so what this theorem is showing is that if you take expected value of the candle style between these two variable types, then this expected value can be written as the following function, which is a combination of two-dimensional Gaussian CDF and three-dimensional Gaussian CDF, where this true latent correlation sigma is going to appear in one of the correlation matrices. Um, note that I highlighted one other parameter here, which is the truncation at the latent level. So strictly speaking, it depends not just on this latent correlation, but also at what the truncation level has been. However, um, this is not an issue. There is a very easy method of moment estimators for this truncation level. Um, and just to give you intuition why this is easy, so here is our um, latent Gaussian copula and observe. Essentially, what we want to estimate is this delta, the truncation level at, at the latent Gaussian uh, layer at the top, rather than the truncation level at the observed layer. And the reason this is easy, once we are at the latent Gaussian level, marginally, this is standard normal distribution, mean zero, variance one. What we know from the data is that out of this five, in this example, five samples, three samples happen to have zero. That's what we can observe. So in other words, we can estimate delta just 
looking at the proportion of zeros and then applying um, standard normal inversity. So that's why this is not an issue. Any questions so far? All right. Um, so because it's moment based, um, it's approximately unbiased. And here I'm just illustrating that that's indeed the case in practice. Um, so here we looked at the 150 by 150 correlation structure generated using um, um, conditional independence graph with band structure. And the true correlation values uh, at the horizontal line, our estimated correlation values are vertically. And what you can see is that they all align on this y equal x line, which shows that um, it's roughly unbiased. Um, so we can prove monotonicity. So in other words, we can show that this bridge function f, um, and we have to show it for each of the function types that we find is strictly monotone, strictly increasing. Um, that allows us to conclude that the inverse exists. Um, this is the theoretical result. Um, practically, things are a little bit complicated. Um, so this is one example of the function f. So we know explicit form, so that's great. Now we need its inverse. Um, I don't know what this inverse explicit form is. And so in practice, uh, we need to compute this inverse numerically. So what we do in practice is we take the candle cell um, that we can compute. Uh, we take a function that we write that implements our f, which we know explicit form. And then essentially we do this uni root optimization problem solution, uh, which we know the solution exists and is unique from theory, but it does require this one-dimensional optimization for each pair of variables that you want to find a correlation for. Um, so as you may imagine, this can get computationally quite heavy um, if you have a large number of variables or if you want to try to use this method with um, subsampling or bootstrapping or cross-validation. Um, so recently, we actually uh, built um, an alternative approach to how to solve it numerically using um, fast approximation based on linear interpolation. And if you are interested in the end of the talk, I would be happy um, to talk about exactly what this does. But um, ultimately, bottom line is we can compute this very fast. Okay, so what is the consistency result? Um, so what we can show is essentially the estimator of our latent correlation matrix sigma uh, converges to the true sigma. This is uh, max element-wise norm. Um, and the rate is the standard rate that you would expect. The constants are different. And um, the proof roughly relies on showing Lipschitz continuity of the inverse of the bridge function. Um, I think the proof is actually quite interesting, but I know I may, you may not share that. So I do have some slides in the end that can walk through a little bit more how this is proved, um, but only if there are questions on that. Okay. So let's come back to the example data. So recall that we have two views, gene expression and microRNA from the same 500 subjects. And our interest here was to find what is the association between those two uh, types of data. And the challenges were high dimensionality, skewness in gene expression, and zero inflation in microRNA. So to find association between two sets of variables, um, a very classical approach is canonical correlation analysis. And if you have high dimensionality problem, then there is a lot of variance and extensions to sparse canonical, canonical correlation analysis that takes high dimensionality into account. So here's one formulation of the sparse CCA problem, where essentially we are maximizing the correlation. And here S12 typically is the sample cross covariance matrix subject to some constraints involving um, sample covariance matrix from each of the views individually, and then sparsity constraints for high dimensionality. So the reason I highlight the three matrices here is that hopefully you can see that the way the method depends on the correlation structure is only through the sample um, cross covariance between the two views and each view individual covariance. 
Those are typically standard Pearson sample covariances, which are Emily under normality. Because we're assuming this latent Gaussian model structure, so it's actually very easy for us to adopt this approach. We just substitute our rank based estimator based on the bridge function instead of the standard Pearson covariance mix. Um, so the adaptation is very easy once you compute this thing. Um, so in particular, here, gene expression data is uh, right skewed, but it doesn't have zero inflation. So we treat it as continuous Gaussian populants. Uh, microRNA has lots of zeros, so we treat it as our proposed truncated Gaussian popula. And the full covariance matrix has essentially three types of blocks. So one block is continuous continuous correlations, cross block is continuous truncated correlations, and then the block on microRNA is the truncated truncated correlation. So essentially what happens here is for each of those blocks, you will have its own bridge function when you compute those correlations. All right, so let's see how this works. Um, so because this is a real data, we don't know what the truth is. So what I'm showing you here is out of sample comparison. So essentially we take the data and we split it into train and test multiple times. We um, fit the model on the training data and then this complicated expression for raw hat test is nothing else as out of sample correlation. So the idea is that if this raw hat test is high, then you have a high um, generalization ability of your estimate. And here, the last approach is our candle-based rank estimation with tuning parameters selected using BIC. Um, in comparison, we use the same exact algorithm, the same exact tuning parameter selection, but with a Pearson sample covariance rather than our rank-based estimator. And then we also consider standard CCA and rich CCA, which do not have any sparsity, um, and those don't do as well. Um, but you can see that in comparison to the sample, um, sample covariance by Pearson, that there is an advantage of doing this wrong based copula approach in that our out of sample um, correlation is much higher. So with a look for the biological interpretation of the selected variables um, from the gene expression and the microRNA, so here is the heat map corresponding to the selected variables using CCA. And the samples are color coded by the respective subtype of breast cancer. Um, the subtype information has not been used in the model fitting. So we, CCA is completely unsupervised. So here we found the structure using CCA and now we want to see does it have any biological relevance. And the out of sample correlation based on splitting was very high, larger than 0.9. So we know that those two are very highly related. And what you can hopefully see is that the basal subtype is very distinct in this um, genes compared to the other subtypes. And because the out of sample correlation is so high, you can also see similar trend in microRNA, albeit maybe not as strong. So the second application that I want to show you is the microbiome abundance data. So again, recall here we have tables where um, rows are samples and columns correspond to the microbiome measurements. Um, specifically, we look at the data from Van de Pude, where we are looking at 106 subjects and we combine the microbiome at the genera level. So there is only 91 um, features. Um, we use the data from Wandeputa that is quantitative. So um, I know that some of you may have worked on microbiome data. Typically, it's compositional. Here, we actually have quantitative data, so we can compare the counts across the samples. Um, there is an extension that we have for compositional data that I can also discuss if there are questions. But for now, I'm ignoring that because that's not what this data is like. And the question that we are asking we're interested is what are the conditional independence relationships between genera? In other words, we want to estimate conditional independence graphs corresponding to this 91 genera. And the challenges here is because this is microbiome data, 
it is heavily right skewed and it is heavily zero. So again, the approach we're gonna take, the application here is very similar to what we did in CCA. There are multiple graphical models approaches that have been developed for high dimensional data. Um, in particular, we can look at the neighborhood selection approach, which essentially regresses each of the generis or each of the nodes on its neighbors to find um, the edges. And if you look at the optimization problem corresponding to the neighborhood selection and you open the brackets, essentially the problem depends on the features on the data only through the sample covariance matrices. So there are the assets. And so the standard neighborhood selection will use a uh, um, standard sample covariance um, and compute it like this. Um, in our case, as you may have guessed, we're gonna use our rank-based estimator sigma hat instead of S and the rest of the method remains the same. So um, again, we use neighborhood selection framework for the um, conditional independence graph we're going to use the tuning parameter using star stability selection. And because this data is um, right skewed and zero inflated, we will use our truncated Gaussian copula framework to estimate the um, rank based correlation structure as the input to the method. Um, again, this is real data, so um, I don't know what the truth is. Um, we did simulations with all of these approaches. Um, it worked well in all the simulations, so I'm not showing you the simulations. Um, but what I think was interesting on this data, we compared with another very prominent method um, in microbiome graphical models literature. And we wanted to see how the results differ. Like we know we do better in simulations, but we wanted to see how the results differ in real data. And here, um, sort of the worst case scenario, I think, is if everything is different. Um, since the method STICKYZ is very prominent, there is certain trust in the results, and I don't think all the results are wrong. So I wouldn't want to see something that is completely different that we find. Um, on the other hand, if the results are exactly the same, then what is the advantage of using this rank based estimation? So what I'm showing you here is the plot of some generis that had um, higher uh, partial correlations, stronger edges. And the upper triangle is what is found by our approach using this truncated Gaussian popular uh, correlation estimation. And the bottom triangle, the lower triangle, is what is found by this um, existing method. And what you can see is that very nicely, they agree a lot. There are a lot of um, edges or partial correlations that they both find and that coincide. So this. Um, this square is mirrored around this line. However, you can also find that there are some disagreements. So um, for example, over here, you can see that there are a lot of edges that were found by the old method that our model says should not be there. Um, similarly, there are some edges um, that are more stronger in our model that Stickies didn't find. And since based on our simulation results, our approach is more accurate, um, there is some evidence that this upper triangle um, is a more accurate representation of what is actually happening. So um, to summarize what I've talked about is the zero inflated data um, and latent Gaussian modular for this data. Um, the way we're doing the estimation is to um, use the bridge functions for which we have an explicit form. Um, one thing that may have not been um, easy to get from the presentation, but I want to emphasize within this Gaussian copula model, there is this uh, monotone transformation function. We don't have to estimate that function to estimate the latent correlations. The knowledge of the bridge function does not require the knowledge of the monotone transformation. And so that monotone transformation is never estimated. And that's, I would argue, is a big advantage. Um, our model allows to model dependency between mixed variable types, um, in particular what I mean by mixed, uh, continuous, or binary, or zero inflated. Um, you saw that um, it can be easily applied to canonical correlation analysis and graphical models estimation. 
Um, and actually many other techniques, if you have a method that just relies on the sample covariance matrix, then the mechanics is actually very straightforward. Instead of that sample covariance matrix, you plug in this new rung-based estimator for latent correlations. Um, and finally, I think I still have some time. Um, what I'm really excited about, and this is something that we have just finished, um, and I'm only going to give you a couple of slides, um, but everything that I presented so far is the frequentist approach to this model. In other words, um, we are estimating this latent correlation matrix using uh, bridge functions, and then we're using it in the frequentist approach to a CCA and graphical models. However, the model can actually be used in Bayesian settings as well um, using the sampling. So if you um, use it in the Bayesian settings, then you can forget all about the bridge function and just do it through the sampling. So to be specifically, um, so this is our model again. So we have the latent Gaussian level. So we have a Jth variable that is standard Gaussian. Then we have the copula level with some monotonic transformation Fj. And then we have observed zero inflated Xj because there is a threshold. So the way to summarize it, this is the model, again, the top level. You have multivariate latent Gaussian. Then you have the copula level, which I, uh, for convenience, write as a combination of the inverse CDFs corresponding to the transformation and the standard normal CDF corresponding to the latent Gaussian level. And after the copula, you have the truncation step. Okay, so those are the three things. And essentially, to sample from this model, you can actually sample from it relatively easily in a Bayesian framework. So the idea is that once you have your observed data X, you first of all find all the measurements in your observed data that are non-zero. And for all of those non-zero measurements, you can essentially estimate what the corresponding latent Gaussian measurement should have been using the empirical CDF. And that um, comes from the second part, from the second copula. Once you have those estimated latent measurements for non-zeros, you can then do the Gibbs sampling for the zeros, conditional on those. Um, so in other words, um, if you have an observed zero in your data, you can sample what is the underlying latent normal using truncated Gaussian distribution. Um, and for the threshold, you can use um, non-informative prior, which essentially means that you are sampling from the uniform distribution um, conditional on the boundaries. And so if you do it this way, you don't need to use the bridge functions approach. Um, and our work that used this Bayesian approach um, has just appeared on the archive. We use it in the context of graphical model estimation for uh, microbial association networks. Um, and specifically, uh, we use our truncated latent Gaussian copula model as described. Um, we put the spike and slot prior on the precision matrix at the latent Gaussian level. And then uh, additionally, what we do is we incorporate the phylogenetic tree information um, on the edge inclusion probabilities. So essentially, all of this extra stuff comes at this precision matrix level modeling. Once you have that precision matrix modeling, the truncated laden copular sampling can be done the way I described on the previous. Uh, what's the advantage of this approach? Um, well, here, this is what we get on the microbiome data that we previously analyzed. Uh, each of the nodes is one particular genera, um, and each of the edges um, is um, present of a partial correlation. And hopefully what you can see is that the results from this Bayesian approach suggest that there are communities within this um, genera. And this communities actually have nice biological interpretation. Um, for example, this community in red at the bottom, um, all of these genera uh, either need oxygen to survive or can tolerate oxygen. 
whereas the top two communities, um, they need an oxygen-free environment. Um, and we did not use this information on the model feeding, but we did use the phylogenetic tree information, and we did um, take zeros into account using our truncated Gaussian Cosima model. All right, so um, to summarize, there's a lot of things that I have covered. The main um, reference is the top paper in Biometrica. This is the one that discusses the bridge functions, the modernity results, consistency. Um, our first microbiome data application is here. Um, this is the computations, and this is the most recent work on how to put this in Bayesian settings. Um, and we have some R packages. Feel free to use them and let me know if you find any bugs. And thank you very much. Great, great. Yes, very exciting talk. And any question for Irina? And while people might be thinking, about, actually, I myself have a couple of questions. It's very exciting, yeah. very smart idea. And so actually, I will, at first, when I saw this like a truncated promise, I was thinking, OK, yeah, the threshold is something that has to be estimated. So at first, my original idea was like, oh, it might be not so easy because there's, you know, when you have this couple of models, there's always, you have a short right, right. variable. But later, I realized that, oh, yeah, because when you use the proportions, you, what you actually need is a, because we have this kind of module, like a standard Gauss. Exactly, so because the marginal. Yeah, right. that, that's why it's not an issue. Right, right. So yeah, I think that's a very beautiful idea. I think another idea, I don't know whether that would be useful, but I was thinking about the other possibilities, like you can use the lower bounds, right? Because for same variable, you yeah. could use the lower bound, but I don't know whether that's going to be a beta method or not. Oh, sorry, this is wrong. Sorry. Actually, this is what comes up in the Bayesian sampling. Oh, okay. So um, what happens, and I know I went a little bit fast, but in case you know what I'm talking about, this was useful. In case you don't know what I'm talking about, hopefully you will get a rough idea on how to do it. But this is the latent threshold, delta J. And if you put a non-informative prior on that, that is equivalent to sampling it uniformly from the maximum of the truncated one and the minimum of the observed one. Okay, I see. So I, see. I think what you were saying is just take the min. Mm -hmm. right. And what this is saying is like, it's, well, here, essentially you're sampling uni uniformly between those two points. Right, right, yeah. Okay, okay, I see. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yes, yes. And I'm just curious. One, another thing is that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I have a lot of backup slides depending on okay. who is in the audience and what are the questions. Right, so I'm just curious, like in the. So in the high dimensional case, you can get a consistency, like a, the, the, the convergence rate. So I was thinking about if it's in the low dimensional case and have like say the fixed dimension, it seems to me that this idea, you could still obtain something like an asymptotic normality kind of risk. Oh, well, I haven't looked into the distribution. Okay. But um, the, I mean, the actually the high dimensionality and the consistency is, mm -hmm. it, it's most of the proof does not require high dimensionality. Mm -hmm. The high dimensionality, um, Sorry. Essentially comes that I'm looking at the max sup norm. Right. And that's so because I, that, that's where that log p comes in. But if you just looked at one element, mm -hmm. um, that's actually the hardest part of that proof. It's <laughs> not what you do when you add the sup norm later on. That's where a lot of the techniques can be expanded. It's actually how do you show that this function is Lipschitz continuous with a certain bound. Nice. Um, and that's where um, the original proof in Fon et al. GRSSB, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that paper, but they essentially do like um, conditional rewriting. Oh, actually, here, I have the slide I can explain. Sorry. Um, so like this is, for example, one of the functional forms. This is the most complicated one. This is truncated, truncated case, and it's a combination of two four-dimensional CDFs. So in fun, you only had two-dimensional CDFs. So you do this kind of thing, and then you find your Lipschitz constant that is uh, you know, independent of model parameters. We realize that if you try to find a Lipschitz constant for this thing, it's a little bit more complicated. <laughs> right, I can see that, yes. <laughs> So what we actually had to do um, is to use this result. And essentially what this says 
is that if you have a d-dimensional normal CDF and you want to take a derivative with respect to one element of that uh, correlation or covariance structure, <clears throat> then that derivative can be written as an integral of strictly non-negative quantity. Uh, which is actually how you get monotonicity to begin with, uh, because, yeah. I see. So then the, all you need to do is to argue that that constant H1 so is like keep, keep categorizing the, the... Yeah. So the, essentially what do you have is you have a multiples of them. So here's an example of how it works out. So here you have four dimensional. So if you look at all the pairs, you do all the derivatives, and then you have the chain rule. And then all of the red guys are positive. So mm -hmm. I know the whole thing is positive. So that's easy. Um, if you want to do the Lipschitz, you need a little bit more. You need this. The lower bound, yes. But I have multiple terms. And as long as I can get one of them to be bounded, <laughs> the whole thing is going to be fun. Right, right, yeah. And so that's essentially what we do. OK, I see, I see, I see, I see. I see. It's it's a little bit involved, but it, it goes through. <laughs> I see. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, that's very beautiful. Very beautiful idea. Very beautiful work. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Other questions from the audience? Oh, oh. there is a QA. Is a Can question. you provide more intuition on how you derived bridge functions? Yes. Um, let me see if I have a slide for that. Uh, sorry. Uh, no, I do not have a slide for that, but I could explain. So let me see. Where is the first one? Okay. So the bridge function by the definition is the expected value of Kendall stuff. So essentially, this is what I call a brutal force proof. So you take the Kendall style, you take the expected value, and you keep simplifying until you arrive at something that you can write as the CDF. To be specifically, um, so the Kendall style has this sum form. So if you try to take the expected value of it, because expected value is linear, you essentially need to just figure out what is the expected value of the sign product of the pairs. Now, the advantage that comes in in the truncated case, and I'm going to illustrate truncated continuous because it's a little bit easier to understand, is essentially, so let's say we look at the variable j. And we are comparing what happens at the sample i versus sample i prime. If both of those things are zero, which is possible with zero inflated data, then that part is not in the expected value. The expected value of zero is just zero. So essentially, when we look at the expected value of this product, we put indicators on whether they're zero or non-zero. And when either this two are zero or those two are zero, those parts strictly disappear from the expected value. When those parts are non-zero, um, this is where we use the definition. When those parts are non-zero, we know that this indicator event has happened. So that means that comparing x's is equivalent to comparing u's, and because this monotone transformation is strictly continuous, that is equivalent to comparing the z's, the, the Gauss inputs. And once you become to comparing the z's, that's where those CDFs of the normal distribution comes in. So I'm, I know this is kind of fingers <laughs> explanation, but I do hope that it answers your question. Let's see. Actually, I'm not sure how I can see the rest of Oh, here we go. Uh, yeah, I hope that that answers the question. I didn't type. I said, I'm not sure if people typically say that. I think Andrew also says, yeah, it's very cool. Also, yeah. <laughs> just one other uh, curious. I, I was just thinking that uh, is it part, because we all know that a trend is like, yeah, when you're assuming it's latest normal, this is like a trans, this trans normal, non normal assumption. Yeah, non paranormal, yes. 
Right, I, I was thinking that you could also test whether that assumption works, right? Because after you have estimated everything, like the generic model, it's basically, it's possible to do the model checking in this case, right? Um, I'm not actually 100% sure how you would test for mm -hmm. that. I do know that we actually did a minor violation to it and it still works um, in simulations. And the violation is actually as follows. Um, let me get the picture because it's easier to understand. So here in the model, the model is actually not for count data. The part that is above threshold is continuous, but we're using this model for count data. And so essentially the reason it works is if you look at the microbiome data and you look at the high counts or at the microRNA data and you look at the high counts, it's very unlikely that in your data, you would have a lot of samples that let's say I exactly 123 or 1031 or something like that. So even though it's count, those counts are pretty unique. And so continuous model is a very good approximation. When you go into the lower counts, you often have a non-negligible amount of measurements, for example, that have exact count one but we treat it as continuous. Mm -hmm. um, in practice, this still leads to unbiased estimation and simulations and everything works, but you could argue that that's not strictly what, it's, it's a violation. It's maybe a minor violation, but it's a violation of the model. I see, I see, okay, very great. Very cool, very cool. Yeah, other you. questions for Irina? Yeah, I think people might be very exciting about the, you know, like it's going to be a long weekend here. So <laughs> I know it's it's yeah. hard. It's the uh, end of the semester. I, I assume it's the end of the semester. Correct? Oh, we still have one more week. So this oh, like you still have one more week. Okay. Yeah. We still have one more week. Yes. All right. Okay. So if no other questions, then then we should we let's all thanks Irina yeah. again and thank you for this wonderful talk. Oh, thank you so much for invitation and for attending and for the questions. I appreciate it. Yeah, very exciting work. And see you all. All right. Okay, thank you. See you later. Bye. Bye.